morning and welcome to the Tuesday, March 14th uh, Regional Transportation Committee meeting. I am your chair, Steve Conklin. Uh, thank you for being here this morning. Also want to welcome a brand new member, Austin Ward from the City and County of Broomfield, uh, who serves on the Dr. Cog board and is one of our Dr. Cog members. So thank you very much for being here today. With that, we will move ahead to public comment, if there is any public comment, and I'll look to uh, Pam for guidance on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I will give it a second, but I currently don't see any hands raised at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, in your packet, there's the uh, meeting summary for February 14th, 2023. Call your attention to that. There will be one change. Uh, during the course of the meeting, Kevin Flynn had to leave because of a commitment as chair, and I stepped in as vice chair to finish out the meeting, and that will be reflected just so the record shows that, that we had, had that situation in the meeting. With that, we'll move ahead to action items, and our first is policies for fiscal year 2024-2027, the CHIP set-aside programs. And I will introduce Josh, Josh, I'm not speaking well this morning, <laughs> Josh Schwank to uh, talk about that, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh. All right, we're back. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, here this morning to talk about our set-aside program. So just wanted to give a quick overview on how those fit into our transportation planning work. So really this diagram shows everything sort of from the most broad and long range at the top down to the most uh, specific at the bottom, maybe should have been designed as a funnel, just thinking about that right now. But so at the top, uh, we have MetroVision, sort of our broad uh, long range plan for the region that covers a broad range of topics. Uh, the specific transportation subset is then broken out into our currently our 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan that sets that long-term vision for our transportation network in the region. And of course, within that is the fiscally constrained project list, that list of projects that we think we'll be able to afford based on the revenues we expect to be available within that time frame. Next, we have our Transportation Improvement Program, which is that short-term four-year pro program of projects. Uh, where funding is specifically dedicated to specific projects. And then within that tip, um, we have our set-aside programs. So what are our set-aside programs? All of you are probably very familiar with our calls for projects. Uh, for the tip, we were wrapping up our fourth one uh, in the past year. Um, so you've seen that several times. Um, so in general, our calls for projects split that funding out between a regional and sub-regional pot. Projects are selected and then those go to the board, well, through all of our committees and finally the board for final selection. But before that whole process occurs, we do split some of that funding off the top um, and as the name implies, set it aside for specific reasons. Um, all of those programs are defined before the whole process begins in our TIP policy. So when the board approves the TIP policy to begin a call for projects process, it includes how much funding is set aside and what purposes that funding is set aside for. Um, several of those set aside programs have their own calls for projects and those project selections then also come through the committees and board for final project selection. So currently in the TIP policy, there are five technically, um, but we'll say eight set aside programs. It's a little bit confusing as you can see in the diagram. Um, I'll run through uh, the ones along the top first. Uh, so we have a regional transportation operations and technology set aside that really uh, puts funding towards um, ITS improvements, traffic signal improvements, uh, transportation operations around the region. Then we have our air quality improvements set aside. That's a little bit different from the others in that uh, rather than holding a call for projects, that funding is given over to the Regional Air Quality Council uh, to help fund some of their programs. We have our human services transportation set aside. Uh, that goes, uh, you'll actually hear a little bit more about that on the next agenda item, um, but that funding is for uh, transit improvements, specifically for older adults, low income folks. Um, and then we have our transportation demand management set aside that funding goes towards programs that encourage non-SOV travel around the region. All of those set-asides have carried over from previous tips, um, but we also have a new set, um, just grouping them under the title of Corridor Community Livability and Innovative Planning, or CLIP for short. Um, so these are transportation corridor planning that's really looking at uh, major corridors throughout the region. Uh, that's 
That program is being piloted right now, so you may have seen that. Also currently being piloted is our community-based transportation planning, where we're working specifically with uh, community-based organizations on transportation planning, centering some marginalized communities in the region. We have our new livable centers small area planning uh, that's going to look at the intersection of land use and transportation in community nodes. So that might be urban centers, that might be station areas, other uh, centers of communities. And then innovative mobility that's going to look at uh, planning, studying, and piloting some innovative solutions to mobility challenges around the region. So in the past, each of these set-asides uh, would develop their own policy guideline document. They would bring that through the committees and board uh, prior to holding their individual call for projects, um, which worked. Um, but uh, occasionally that meant some inconsistent information was provided across the individual set-asides. And of course, that meant information was only available just prior to the opening of a call for projects. So we've developed a single policy document that covers all of our set-aside programs. Uh, the idea here is to bring all of that information together across those eight programs into a single document. So that can be a single point of reference for interested uh, applicants to refer to. Um, we've also tried to standardize the information available across all of the set-asides and really streamline that process when a call for projects opens. Uh, because that will be a standing policy, they won't have to come back through uh, the committees each time they open a call for projects. So I won't go through all of this, but you can see sort of the standard structure that's available for each program in the document. Um, so any interested applicant can go to the document, they can find the specific program they're interested in, and they'll be able to find some uh, standard information available about that program. So again, the idea here uh, was to really bring all this information together into one place, uh, but to keep it separate. Um, so each program has its own chapter in the document. So you don't have to refer to multiple locations to find information. It's all uh, compact together in one section. Again, a standardized structure, so it should be easy to navigate. Um, we've tried a little bit to standardize some application processes. So in the past, a lot of our set-asides have used a two-step program where they begin with a letter of intent followed by a formal application. So we've tried to bring that across most of the set-asides. Um, and again, when a call for projects occurs, um, project selection will still come through the committees and board. Um, and if there are any amendments to the document, any changes to the policy prior to the opening of a call for projects, that will come through the committees and board as well. So finally, just wanted to show this. Um, this is just kind of a high level schedule. Um, it's in six month increments. Uh, so we will have more detailed information available on our website about specific dates when all of these programs intend to open. And of course, we'll send out information through all of our channels uh, when a call for projects is opening. But at least this will provide some high level information so applicants can plan uh, they know when to expect uh, certain programs to open and hold their calls for projects. Uh, so we think that will provide some additional benefit as well. So I do have a proposed motion for you, but first, uh, happy to take any questions you may have. Do we have any questions? And I just totally went into... Uh, Commissioner Williams, Director Williams. Sorry, first time. <laughs> That's all right. As long as you don't call me Mayor Williams, we'll okay. be okay. <laughs> 18 would be too many. Um, I have a couple questions that I, I'd like to just put in the record. I don't necessarily want an answer right now, Josh, but um, I'm just wondering what percent of the population of the region um, qualifies as marginalized communities? And what percent of the population of the region falls under older adults, veterans, low-income people, and people with disabilities? And I just think that's something that might be a part of this presentation. Um, thank you. Thank you. And I don't have those numbers on me right now. We do have a marginalized communities data set available on our uh, regional data catalog, and we can easily pull those numbers. Okay. With no other comment, uh, Chair would entertain a motion. I can move. Dr. Williams. I can move. 
move to recommend to the Board of Directors the adoption of the policies for fiscal year 2024 through 2027 TIP set aside programs. And a second from uh, Director Beal. Thank you very much. Any discussion before we vote? And we're able just to do a. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? And any abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. We'll move ahead with the Transit Supercall project funding for July 2023 through June 2024. And we'll hear from Travis Noon, Program Manager and AAA Grant Compliance F. Gordon, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, hopefully this works well, but if you can't hear me very well, just let me know. Uh, here today presenting to you all the uh, Project recommendations for the Human Service Transportation TIP set aside, as well as the FTA Section 5310 funding uh, for July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2024. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, we do release a com combined call for projects for these two funding streams, as well as the Older Americans Act funding for transit projects. Uh, these three funding streams really do complement each other and provide uh, funding for transit projects that primarily benefit older adults and individuals with disabilities. Uh, the projects are intended to be implemented between July 1st and June 30th of next year. Uh, there, with this call for projects, we did receive proposals from 16 organizations requesting nearly $11 million for transit capital operating and mobility management projects. Uh, between the three funding sources, there is approximately $8 million available. Dr. Cog does convene an independent review panel to review these proposals and make the recommendations. Dr. Cog's staff does participate in that review. Uh, however, we are this, they're, they're just as uh, subject matter experts. We don't participate in making the recommendations. Uh, the recommendations from the committee are included in your agenda packet. Uh, and I would like to point out a few things that are in there. Uh, first, in the spirit of full transparency, we do want to acknowledge that there was a recommendation uh, to award the Dr. Cog Area Agency on Aging. $900,000 for its consumer, uh, consumer Choice Voucher Transportation Program. Uh, in addition, there were a few projects that weren't recommended for funding. Uh, this included the City of Golden's proposal. Uh, the City of Golden requested $6,000 for a flex ride uh, voucher program in the city. Um, that proposal mainly wasn't recommended because of the size of the request. We do have a recommended minimum of $25,000 for these projects. Anything below that, uh, we do require a strong justification to uh, re uh, award less than that. Uh, the other projects not recommended were uh, VIA Mobility Services capital projects. Uh, VIA Mobility Services was awarded funding uh, based on the available funding that was there and their priorities. So VIA's first priority was for ongoing operating mobility management support, uh, and that was what uh, they, they were awarded as opposed to the capital. Uh, I also do want to just uh, remind the committee here that the Older Americans Act portion, while included in your packet, is under the purview of the AAA in Dr. Cog, and we'll go through the Advisory Committee on Aging for approval. Uh, the committee here is looking at DHST and 5310 approvals only. Uh, I do have a recommended motion here for you all, um, and I'll pass this back to the chair, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Shows the presentation was that awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Do we have a motion? Director uh, Ward. Thank you. I move to recommend to the Board of Directors approval of HST and FTA 53 projects for July 2023 through May 2024 as recommended by peer review staff recommended carryover projects. Thank you very much. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Director Shaw. Any discussion before we move ahead to a vote? Okay. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And all opposed, nay. And any abstentions? Did you have something you wanted to say? No, I didn't. Okay. I, I thought turn I, off my mic. Okay. I, I just wasn't <laughs> sure. Okay, very good. Thank you. And yeah, we will move ahead at this point. Moving ahead uh, to informational briefings. Taking action on Regional Vision Zero Action Plan 2023. We'll receive an update from uh, Emily Kleinfelter, Safety and Regional Vision Zero Planner. Emily, thank you for being here.
All right. Excuse me. Can you hear me okay? Sorry, I'm fighting a little bit of a cold right now, so appreciate you guys hanging in with me. Um, and thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Emily Kleinfelter. I'm the Safety and Regional Vision Zero Planner for Dr. Cog. Um, and I'm going to be telling you guys a little bit about the implementation uh, update that we are setting out on. Um, first, I just want to kind of set the stage. This is a map of the concentration of fatalities from 2016 to 2020 um, of the Dr. Cog region. And as you can tell, we definitely um, have, a, have a high concentration level across our region that we need to be addressing. So why is this update now? Well, um, for one, as you just saw in that, that graphic, um, progress is stalled. We're moving in the wrong direction as far as our serious injury and fatality numbers. Um, there's also been a new approach to safety called the Safe Systems Approach that has become more and more a part of the transportation safety um, just way of, of moving things forward um, that has become a new national approach. Um, as you're all hopefully aware, we have the IJA or the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law that's brought about a lot of money towards safety um, opportunities and funding those projects. Um, and then last but not least, we've heard from you all and our, our um, member governments that it's time to take another look at what we've been doing and um, come at it with a strategic update. So just a reminder, we adopted um, the Taking Action on Regional Vision Zero Plan in June of 2020. And it's now March 2023. And um, so these are the, the chapters that make up the um, action plan. As you can see, we have a lot of content within it. Um, but this strategic update is really going to be focusing here on Chapter 6, our implementation plan, which is really the, a lot of the meat of that plan that's helping us lay out the objectives and the actions that we uh, feel as though will help us move towards our goal of zero. And then last but not least, another new addition with this update work is going to be a Vision Zero story map. Um, this will be a companion resource to the Vision Zero action plan that our member governments and locals um, and the public and even ourselves can use um, to help identify um, safety projects and things across the region. Um, we are still scoping out that work, but I will keep you guys updated as we, as we do that. Um, so Chapter 6, that implementation plan, here again is a reminder of what that looks like in our current plan. Um, it's kind of, it's got a lot of information at it, and I'll, I'll walk you through it. We've got our objectives, and then the action initiative, and then sub-actions, and a responsibility for who is going to be taking care of those actions, as well as an action year that we planned on trying to see those take place or be completed by, and then last but not least, performance measures for some of those actions. So as you can see, it's a lot of good information, but frankly, it's not all the information that we need. There's some missing information here that we think um, a strategic update could help us fill out and, and fully flesh out all the, the, the details and um, things that we need to know in order to move forward on all these objectives and the, the actions that we list um, um, under them. So um, I mentioned the Vision Zero story map. We will also, like I said, be um, putting that together with our RPD and GIS teams. Um, this will explore ex upon expanding upon our Vision Zero um, toolkit, as well as the high injury network and critical corridors, and looking at some of our crash and behavior profiles within that. Um, we will be starting out scoping that with our RPD team later this month. And this is an example. If you're not familiar with what a story map might look like, this is our complete street story map that the RPD team put, up, put together. It's an incredibly useful tool and resource for folks. Um, it's, what I love about it is it's interactive. You can um, play around with the layers and, and really understand what you want to, to get from that map. Um, and then, so I've been talking about um, how we're going to be doing this update and really what is the most important part about it is who is going to be helping with it. And that is our Regional Vision Zero work group, which is actually going to be meeting in um, just a little bit at 10 o'clock today um, to have our first workshop um, putting together this work. And so that, that work group is made up of transportation safety professionals, many of which are part of your government, um, are part of your teams, and they help me, you know, put together this work, um, and they are um, really imperative to this process. So I encourage you, if you don't have somebody on your team that's part uh, participating in this work group, to um, invite them or let me know, and we can get them on those monthly invites, um, because that's really how we're going to push forward the, um, the update, is with the input of the locals. And then just a quick timeline um, to let you know where we're at with everything. Uh, I brought this to TAC last month, and here we are 
um, with RTC. And like I mentioned, our first workshop is starting just a little bit later today with the Regional Vision Zero work group. Um, I'm really eager to get that going, see how it um, plays out with everybody. And um, then I will actually, I forgot to update this because we did a little bit of um, internal scheduling work, but we will be coming back to you all in July um, with another update on how everything's going before I come back to you again um, later in the year with the final updates and everything like that for your review. And then um, we aim to be publishing this um, strategic plan update in December or early of next year. And then the Vision Zero story map follows a similar timeline um, with the design work beginning probably around May and then us hoping to publish that story map in early of 2024 as well. And um, just going to say that Vision Zero is possible if we all collaborate and work together. We know um, how to save lives. And so let's just let's work together to, to do that. Any questions? Questions? Uh, Director uh, Buvex. Uh, Emily, your summary page indicates that 2022 7 for lost and traffic fatalities. What was the number back in 2020 when the program was initiated? I am not familiar off the top of my head, but I can get back to you. Um, but I do know that our numbers have been increasing yearly. First slide, the fatality concentration by county seems to indicate traffic congestion is a driver in traffic. <clears throat> I don't know if I would fully agree with that. I think that sometimes congestion actually can be a driver in creating safe systems for folks. Um, I think that they're definitely two things that we need to address, but um, congestion often, oftentimes actually can create a safer environment for people. Um, in the area that is, is shown on the map in, in the most congested traffic areas, you've got the highest concentration. Well, I think, um, Ron, do you have a? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> There's always one more button. Always. There's Thank always. you, Director Stanton, for your technical assistance. <laughs> Uh, Director Buzek, I, I think that we don't believe that there's a direct correlation necessarily between congestion and traffic fatalities. There's, there can be more of a correlation to speeds, actually. And we actually saw, because during the pandemic, we actually saw fatalities increase, even though congestion was down, traffic was down, but speeding was way up. Um, and so while I don't necessarily believe that congestion is a good strategy for addressing safety problems or reducing crashes, um, we don't see a direct correlation between congestion and fatalities. There can be a correlation between congestion and crashes, but generally under congested conditions, crashes can tend to be less severe because the traffic is moving more slowly. Um, so you see the fatalities more associated with, with speed um, speed conditions and, and other conditions like that. So in the slide that talks about vision zero is possible, you, you it, a modal shift, getting people out of their cars will save 3,000 lives per year. I, I guess there's this plan. Uh, we, uh, Director, uh, uh, Director Broom, had you had a question earlier? No. Okay. Uh, Director Shaw. Thank you so much. I had a question on the first slide with the color blocks by congestion uh, or fatalities. Um, there's a little blue area near Broomfield, and I wondered if um, there's something we can learn from Broomfield, or if that's like a reservoir or something. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely, I agree. I think there's definitely something to be said about um, we have things to learn all across the region from all of our different member governments. Um, and yeah, Broomfield definitely is showing a, a lower um, concentration, and so there's probably some, some lessons to be learned from them. Thank you. Director Ward. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is going to be re uh, regarding the split between 
car to car crashes and car to pedestrian or crashes. Um, does this data set factor in both of those or are we just looking at car to car crashes in this? This, this image. So this image, I just want to lay on it. This is not a Dr. Cog map. This is actually provided by the um, FHWA, I want to say. Um, this is a uh, map that I would be happy to provide you that um, they put out about safe systems across the entire, safety and fatalities across the uni entire United States. This is just a screenshot of our um, Dr. Cog region. Um, and the map actually shows some really interesting information. But what I can tell you is that this is all fatalities, not splitting it up based on um, mode um, or user. And so there are, though, within that map, I'd be happy to provide you guys the link, um, there is some more breakdown of types of modes. And um, they also have the um, equity justice layer that's overlaid with this map for you to be able to understand some other um, demographic impacts as well with fatalities and serious injury crashes. Okay. Thank you. Um, the reason I asked that is because and last month, I was at the National Association of Counties um, T conference, and there in the transportation form, they indicated that uh, all severe and fatal crashes for um, or severe and fatalities for car to car crashes are down overall. It's the car to pedestrian crashes that are up, and I was wondering if that was the case for our area or if we're and is not following the national trend. I would have to double check on our numbers, but from what I recall, and Alvin, do you have to, can you maybe double check me on this? But from what I know, our numbers are unfortunately on trend with national numbers. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Dr. Williams. Thank you. Emily, is this program done in schools? Are we, do we have a Vision Zero outreach in the schools? Because I, I remember, and it was a long time ago, when I went to school, we had a very specific program about look both ways and don't step in the street and pedestrian safety, which is a defensive tactic. And I'm, I'm hoping that we are or could be doing something in our schools. Yeah. So we don't directly have anything that we are doing, but I am both part of the um, CDOT Safe Routes to School Committee, helping you know um, advise on where we're selecting grants for those. And then I'm also a part, or CDOT also has their Advancing Transportation Safety Program, which is doing a lot of focusing on um, safe routes to schools and getting education within schools as well. And you know, CDOT and Dr. Cog, we're, we're definitely partners and working together. And so um, we're helping to make sure that the work that they're doing in schools is um, focused on traffic safety. Mr. Papsdorf. Thank you. And just to augment that a little bit, we did, we, I think we did lose a little bit of ground for a few years when Congress um, made the Safe Routes to School funding source not eligible to be used for educational purposes and could only be used for infrastructure investments. So I think, I think the system lost generally a little bit of ground in terms of those educational programs. And just recently, I think it was the FAST Act that restored the ability to use Safe Routes to School funding for uh, education um, programs, educational programs. So I think we're starting to get back to some of that through that program, but for, for a few years, we lost some ground, certainly. I know a brief, hey, you kids get off my lawn moment from the chair. Uh, <laughs> one of those times I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm uh, becoming my parents or grandparents. I, I think you're right about the, the, the lessons and the, the teaching and look both ways and all of those things. And I think that, that those are something that, that many of us were raised with and were, were ingrained. Uh, I think that, that you know, I in high school had driver's ed as part of the curriculum in high school. And I think that made a difference. And I think as we've seen uh, the education of younger drivers changing, I think that's posed some, some issues there. And I think traffic, uh, a lot of the rules were very predictable. You didn't have the guesswork of going to an intersection and not knowing if you were gonna get a turn light or not a turn light, if you were gonna get the turn light at the beginning or at the end, what's gonna happen. And, and so I think some of that predictability and the, the, the changes in education have, to me, played a role in some of those issues. End of the, hey, you kids get off my lawn moment from the chair. <laughs> Thank you for indulging me. Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much for the presentation. Appreciate you being here. Thank you. 
With that, we will move ahead uh, to item number seven, the North I-25 corridor update. Uh, Jacob Rieger is out ill, so uh, we are fortunate enough to have Ron Papstorf, who will uh, uh, introduce those topic areas for that topic area. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, pretty easy work for me. Um, um, I-25 has been um, undergoing a number of improvements up and down the corridor. So uh, in our effort to keep this important committee informed of um, important work around the region, uh, we did invite our friends at CDOT to give an update on work in the I-25 corridor. So I think I'm going to hand it off to Jessica Mickelbus, the Region 1 uh, director first, and then she can introduce the rest of the team and the presentation. Good morning and thank you for the interest in the I-25 corridor. We're happy to be here today and sharing information about one of our key corridors for both freight and commute and just overall movement throughout the state. Um, for those of you who've been in the Dr. Cog world for quite a while, we gave a presentation probably two years ago. I remember it was virtual, so it was during COVID. Um, on I-25, and we really focused kind of on the southern port portion of at least of Region 1. So it was the gap. I think we came all the way up and kind of ended at downtown. This presentation builds really nicely on that, where we're going to go from Union Station um, north to, into Region 4, and that's where Abra, she'll start the presentation north, and then we'll move south. Um, another exciting thing, our Transportation Commission uh, did a tour of this part of the I-25 corridor several months ago. So Commissioner Stanton, Commissioner Holguin, and Commissioner Stewart, we were on a bus ride together, and we were able to kind of ride um, up and down the North I-25 corridor and really observe. There's a lot of transitional changes that occur from Denver Union Station as you move up into Region 4. So if you haven't had an opportunity to do that drive, um, you know, take a field trip one day and, and try it. There's, there's a lot to observe that we're going to talk about today, some really exciting projects. So thank you for your interest. And with that, I'll turn it over to Abra from Region 4. Great. Thank you. So my name is Abra Geisler. I'm the uh, project director for some segments of this project, and uh, but I'll be covering all of the Region 4 segments for you today. And we, we call them segments um, just to make it easier. We broke down uh, each area by these segments because we couldn't afford to do I-25 all at one time. So we'll be running right through those. So segments seven and eight, that's the, uh, we're under active construction on those. It's the design, build, delivery. Chris Basclu is the project director, so I'll be covering that part. And then I'm on segments five and six, the uh, Mead to Johnstown segment, and that is under a CMGC delivery. So uh, we have quite the investment going on here with a strong focus of safety, multimodal options, and uh, the updating the infrastructure. And as you can see, um, I, there's just a lot going on up there, and to help save the time if you don't want to take a drive, I'll just show you a lot of pictures to, to convey the things that are happening. Um, we're about uh, it's been going on for quite some time. April 2018 is when we started with a completion date in May 2024, about 87% expended, so that's super exciting. It's a 14-mile-long corridor. Um, a lot of infrastructure is getting updated, so the idea is to get in there, build things new, and not have to maintain for a long time. And we have two new ports of entry and two park and rides with a mobility hub as well. And those top pictures that you can see there, I don't know if you can, if I can move the mouse, um, you can see that we actually flipped this interchange, um, and it's pretty cool. The, we, we focused a lot of the resources and money on areas that were really uh, the most unsafe areas in the corridor. So we flipped this interchange here. Um, to where we brought um, the local road over and I-25 goes under. You can see the new ports of entry in this, uh, this photo here. Um, I, I think it's a big improvement. This used to be a tarped building, and now the, the port of entry is a much uh, better place for, for people to go. Also, a lot of trails. This is the, the Poudre River Trail that um, goes from, I, I believe, Greeley all the way over to Windsor. So quite the trail system that we were able to connect underneath I-25 as that was a barrier. And then we have a rolling bridge here that was constructed within a 48 hours. It was only take, the railroad was only taken offline for about 48 hours because we were able to roll that bridge in here. We constructed it offline and rolled it in. 
And so on to segment six, um, the birthed to Johnstown, were same uh, type of situation as segment seven and eight. We started in August of 2019 with uh, the same completion date of seven and eight, which is May of 2024. We're about 81% uh, expended or 81% complete with construction. Uh, this one's a little shorter, about five and a half miles two reconstructed interchange, one being the first DDI in Northern Colorado, uh, a lot of upgraded bridges, again, addressing that aging infrastructure. We also have a mobility hub and it's about a $305 million project. And so um, happy to report that phase one is complete. That's the yellow phase here. And the, the orange phase, phase two is also complete. We were able to shift all of the traffic over in in, on the southbound barrel. So this winter and summer, we're gonna be addressing structure and paving work on the northbound barrel. Um, we're happy to report also that we're 100% done with the design effort. It's been a big, big effort. Um, thousands of pages of design that were now complete. U utility relocations, that's the unsung hero of our project. Um, team doing the utility relocations. It's a lot of work that nobody ever sees. We're about 95% complete with that, and we have one little parcel of right away left to acquire. So this is a side-by-side -side diagram of, or, or pictures of the Colorado 56 interchange. If you're familiar with the Loves truck station, it's also close to that old dirt bike track um, that distracted a lot of drivers and led to a lot of accidents as well because we, we created a wide... Uh, swath both horizontally and vertically, and then the the uh, the dirt track was over here. So this was our most unsafe area along I-25. So once again, we looked at what would make it safer. And <clears throat> again, flipping the interchange was the answer here. The topographic, uh, the land topography just lent itself very well for that flip to be done. And so you can see 56 going over in the old photo you can see how we were able to build up uh, the northbound barrel here. And then um, we had about a 114 day closing where we were able to complete all of this work, which is quite impressive. And we were also able to nest in a mobility hub that I'll talk about a little later, but um, this is a, me a, a median loaded mo mobility hub, which is really nice because buses can travel in the express lane not have to merge over across two general purpose lanes, get on the ramp, wait through a signal, have to get on, merge back over two general pur purpose lanes to the express lane. They're able to pop right off of that express lane, pick people up and pop right back into the express lane. So a big win and um, we have two of those on this corridor. And then moving along, this is the State Highway 60, this is the Johnstown exit. Um, I don't know if you all have heard the buzz of Bucky's coming up to Northern Colorado, but um, right when we built this, they just told us we're going to have 23,000 cars a day extra because of that Bucky. So, <laughs> you know, you, you take the wins where you can get them and then, then you get back to work. Um, and so we, we, made these, um, we made these bridges expandable if we need to do that in the future. But this was a really cool situation too because we have frontage roads all along of our, our project that we were actually able to shut down in partnership with our local agencies. We created a, a, a corridor about a half mile to the east that is gonna be a virgin alignment road uh, that will carry that traffic that these frontage roads carried. But you can see for obvious reasons, the close intersection spacing that this was a really unsafe configuration and so what we were able to do was um, get rid of this road and in partnership with the local agencies and developers, they're building out chunks of that, that arterial. And so um, also a, a phasing win that I'm excited about, we were able to keep traffic going by nesting the DDI bridges in between this bridge here. And so we were able to build both of these bridges um, with traffic going back and forth. So a pretty big interchange reconfiguration with about a 20 day closure to those local agencies. And uh, Johnstown, the city of Johnstown has really wanted to make this the gateway of their, their uh, community. So they've invested quite a lot of money to 
add these these structures on either side. There's actually four of them because there's one, there's two on the uh, north side as well, and landscaping and other things. So this is a really going to be a, a nice gateway to their property. And we're also excited to say that segment five got some funding as well. So we're starting the design and construction of segment five, same type of situation where we're going to be rolling that express lane south down to Mead, um, where it hooks up at a really dangerous part, State Highway 66, where it goes from three lanes and then it goes to two lanes. We're going to be addressing that safety issue there. Um, so upgrading infrastructure, uh, adding one tolling location, lots more work to do there. Right when we're almost done with segment six, we're doing the same thing down at segment five. And here's what the schedule looks like. We're looking for completion 2028 of segment five. Um, we just announced the design contractor uh, today, so that's really exciting. And uh, we're going to get going on that. And going down to segment four, segment four is our uh, lowest uh, crash area. It has the highest level along the corridor because it does have three lanes. So. We haven't, that's our least priority uh, funding segment due to that reason. Um, but we do have 30% uh, plans just to be ready to go if, if, if any momentum um, and funding got uh, assigned here. And what we've been really trying to focus on is the, the multi-mobility and multimodal uh, uh, application of, of improving our infrastructure from an operational and safety stand standard, and that is, um, those mobility hubs are part of that. So we've really concentrated on working with DTR and the Bustang Network on getting a hub every seven to 10 miles. Um, as you can see here, we have some operational hubs in Fort Collins, and then the projects that uh, I just showed you, they're working on getting those built right now. And so this is the Centera Loveland Mobility Hub. They had uh, quite a bit of money put in by the developers to help develop this out. Um, as you can see here, it's another median loaded mobility hub, so really safe application of the mobility hub and bus operation application. And uh, again, the developers are putting a lot of money into the aesthetics for people to really feel invited to use this mobility hub. And then the Berthin Mobility Hub that I mentioned before as well, um, it's more of your boutique type mobility hub. It's, it's, it has 200 spaces, a short little walking distance, um, one of those quick get in, get out type mobility hubs. And then we're also putting a mobility hub in at 119, the Longmont exit. Um, that just started construction about a month ago, so um, we're excited about that. They should all be done right around 2024. And Tom's going to present on the seven mobility hub. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Tom McGinnis with CDOT Region 1. I'm the resident engineer for segments uh, two and three. I need to have you really speak into the mic if you could. Thank you. Okay. Is this better? All right. I actually used to race dirt bikes at that at Bertha Dirt Bike Track, so, and I saw a lot of I-25 car accidents. <laughs> um, but anyways, here is uh, segment three. So this is uh, State Highway 7, or Colorado 7, as we're calling it now, um, and I-25, and this is, a, this is a DTR commission project. We have $16 million uh, for funding on this one. We have $2 million design and $14 million for, with construction. That includes... $2 million of safety funds. We're going to replace the existing span wire uh, signals on both terminals here, um, as well as um, we have a northbound off-ramp Bustang slip ramp here and a southbound uh, slip ramp here, as well as a pedestrian bridge um, connecting both sides. And then we are proposing a, a half of the park and ride um, at this location, and this t this ties into the Lark Ridge development. And so the, the future build-out for this project is a full interchange replacement. It's a diverging diamond, um, and actually the park and ride will be expanded 
all the way down to here um, when that ever comes. So 10 years, five, we don't know. Um, anyways, so um, there will be some, obviously some bus shelter amenities, uh, things like that. Um, and then a potential driver relief station and, and things like that for RTD. Um, so we are currently, this is a 30% drawing that's shown on this side. So we hope to be advertising at the end of this year as long as there's no right-of-way impacts with acquiring this property here from the Perlmutters in the Lark Ridge development. So moving down to segment two, um, so we're going south about 14 miles uh, from where we were. Um, this is 88th Avenue and I-25. This is the Thornton Park and Ride. And uh, you can see the existing bus flip ramps on the outside. We have a lot of safety issues um, on this corridor that we are uh, working towards addressing. Um, we have substandard inside shoulders. We have a two foot express lane buffer, which really should be a four foot, um, as well as a lot of operational challenges with the buses weaving from the express lane to the outside uh, to to get to, to load and unload passengers. Um, so we currently have a transit and safety impact study that we're doing right now to help us come up with some improvements to these slip ramps and provide a, a more streamlined uh, mobility hub here um, than what's shown today. And we're also going to be looking at, you know, what kind of safety widening do we need on I-25 to kind of boost our safety performance metrics uh, or factors in this. So the next step, so we hope that we're, we're kind of wrapping up our analysis this month, and then we hope to moving into an RFP for preliminary engineering, NEPA, and final design. Um, and so our, our 10 year funds for this, we have 20 million available right now for, for PE, NEPA, and final design. Um, and then we have fiscal year 27, we have 90 million construction. So we know that's not going to get the job done. So we're going to be looking for other potential sources to help fund this, this project. So part of our transit analysis alternatives that we've gotten to um, so far, this is our level three analysis. We've kind of been working through a pretty typical alternative analysis approach here. Um, and we are looking at um, the one on the left being a median station. You may have seen this before in, in our unpublished EA efforts from 2020. And then another one in the middle here is also a median station, but it's using 88th Avenue. So it's an elevated uh, station using T ramps for my 25. It still keeps the buses within the express lanes and avoids that weave. And then the far one to the far right is um, a kind of a hybrid. It's a northbound median station. And then the southbound is using existing slip ramps with some improvements to get the buses back into I-25 via the 84th uh, interchange and on-ramp. So those are the three right now that we're working towards and hopefully having a preferred alternative by the end of this month, so next couple of weeks. Um, just a, again, our current schedule for the safety analysis, we're kind of in this level three right here, you know, which we hope to wrap up by middle to end of March with a preferred alternative. And then we will move immediately into uh, RFP for preliminary engineering, NEPA, and final design. And then construction FY27. And then another project we have, this is moving further south. This is segment one, uh, counterpart of mine at Central Program. This is his project. And essentially it is um, looking at Spear Boulevard and I-25, as well as 23rd Avenue here, um, as far as bridge replacements and then, uh, you know, flex lanes and widening for I-25 safety improvements. And at this point in time, I think it's more of an internal discussion within CDOT based on some concepts that have been developed. So the, the cost for this 
is 80 to 200 million. You know, I think it just depends on, are we just doing bridge replacements and sidewalk connectivity from east and west, or are we doing some I-25 improvements as well? So that's kind of where the big range there. Any questions for Abra or I, Region 4 or Region 1? You referred to Divergent Diamond a couple of times as DDI. Just so we all have the same base of understanding, can you briefly explain what that is? Abra, do you want to? So DDIs are really good when you have directional flow traffic. So um, communities like Johnstown and Milliken, a lot of them go out of their communities in the morning and then come back in in the evening just because of um, operational and commerce centers or elsewhere. And so um, let me bring up that slide actually and I can walk you through what a DDI, how a DDI works. Um, so here, and let me actually use this photo because before we had two different signals um, on the east side that people had to get through and then one signal on the west side here we actually have one signal, so people will be traveling westbound here. They'll stop at the signal here, and then they'll have a free-flowing movement to get onto I-25. So it's a really uh, safety and operationally, it's really efficient. You also get rid of uh, the 90-degree contact points, and so you're more at a skew, and a lot of the injury-leading accidents are because of a T-bone at intersections. So uh, much more efficient and much safer as well. Thank you very much. Very helpful. Uh, Director Williams. I'm trying to get back to where I am. I'm, I'm obviously interested in the mobility hubs. And um, I did see at one point something about charging for vehicles, but I'm um, wondering if all the mobility hubs are going to include charging for not only electric cars, but also for um, electric buses and other multimodal options? Good, good question. So there was a policy directive saying that all uh, state-built parking lots have to have electrical vehicle charging stations. And um, the problem we're running into is the state can't collect revenue on those quite yet. And so we're uh, thinking ahead, building all of the infrastructure, conduit, wiring, uh, transformers for those EV stations for single-use cars. Uh, buses, I'm not quite sure. They won't be at these mobility hubs. These are just quick pickup areas. Um, and so we haven't put any infrastructure into these more pocket-type mobility hubs. On the contrary, um, we hopefully are going to get people out of their cars and into multi-passenger vehicles, on top of which, um, when you're looking at charging stations that you're going to put on top of all the wiring that's built there, um, there are charging stations that allow for e-bike chargers and other, not just cars. Um, so I, I would hope you would look at that stuff. Thank you. Yes, I think that would be a, a, a DTR busting type evaluation. I will say that um, there's quite a big developer going in this area. Uh, it's the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation now called Cascade. Um, and we're working with them hand in hand on the first and last mile type um, circulation of what that development looks like to get people to the mobility hub. Yep. Had there been another hand over here, I thought, uh, Director Broom. I'm sorry, were there a number of old? No, we were, we, we heard the folklore about those and we never ran into them. So we, we had them in our risk register <laughs> and we had all sorts of uh, risks identified and money set aside for that. Uh, they never came to fruition, so we reinvested that money into um, a new on-ramp actually at one of the county roads that didn't have an on-ramp. So that's part of the CMGC model is being able to take unrealized risk, that money, and putting it back into the scope on, on the uh, corridor. Director Broom was waiting to sell you his gold mine up there. 
Commissioner Stewart. Thank you very much. So thanks, you guys, for coming and giving that overview. It looks pretty positive, and it looks um, uh, eminent. And um, all of us sitting here who've worked on this for a long time know that this has been one step forward, two steps back. Uh, 20 years ago, I sat on the Dr. Cog board as the mayor of Broomfield, working on this and US 36. And then 12 years ago, I was the executive director of the TMO, trying to change mobility options on I-25. And now six years, I've been on the Transportation Commission trying to move this project forward, particularly in the Denver metro area. And, and, it, and it's been challenging for lots of reasons. And as you can see, the cost of this project is phenomenal. Um, and in Region 1 in particular, uh, I-25 competes with all the other huge projects that are necessary in Region 1 as well. So just want to thank the professional staff at CDOT who continue to be optimistic and push forward and don't get discouraged and think of things to do. In particular, Segment 2 has had a lot of challenges once we put the managed lanes in. And um, working in a stakeholder group, uh, to try to figure out how to make the best possible safety improvements without significantly expanding I-25 um, has been um, a challenge, and I uh, really appreciate everybody who's weighed in on it. Um, I think we're moving forward. I'm frustrated that 20 years ago, if you told me it'd be 2027 before Segment 2 would be functional uh, and safe, I probably would have just found another job. <laughs> it's, a, it's my coal mine. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like the mobility hub needs to be named uh, Karen Stewart Mobility. There you go. <laughs> <Don't move. laughs> Director Ward. Well, you know, that's oh. better than uh, when I did the recycling center in Broomfield. Uh, they wanted to call it the Karen Stewart uh, queen of trash uh, <laughs> recycling. Honestly, you get in public office and people are happy to help you with those uh, catchphrases. Thanks for all you do, CDOT. I appreciate it. With that, Director Ward. All right. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just have two quick questions. Have you guys considered doing a mobility hub at 120th as well to make it more fit for RTD buses to get up to Highway 7, since currently RTD's practices allow any other operators to pick up and drop off within boundaries? Uh, I am not aware of uh, a mobility hub going in at 120th Avenue, other than the one that's, I think, there, the wagon road. Yeah, the park and ride's there, but it's not very functional if you want to go further up I-25. Um, that's, so, just, that's so, just a little plug. <laughs> no, no, we, we hear you. And we're working with RTD on the State Highway 7 one to provide additional spot to have driver relief stations and, and things of that sort, as well as uh, we have one Sawtooth Bay, I think, in our design for an RTD bus stop up there at State Highway 7. So at least we're going to, you know, try to do our part uh, with this interim hub this hopefully in construction, I don't know if I mentioned that, but hopefully in construction about a year from now. Oh, yes. Briefed on that many, many a times with the city and county of Broomfield. Um, my next question is, in regards to segment one, have there been any considerations to making the express lanes into Union State bi-directional for typically public transit have Morning when it's into Denver, there still is traffic that backs up on I-25 out of Union, and it just makes for a more efficient and quicker drive for those uh, riding public. I, I've heard some talk about that, but I'm not really sure. Jessica, if you want to weigh in on reversible section. Yeah, good question. Thank you. And just to highlight, um, we have a fantastic working partnership with RTD on all of our projects as we do our transit analysis up and down I-25. They're sitting at the table with us um, as we plan our mobility hubs and we talk about bus function. We always make sure that we're partnering with them and their vision as well. 
Um, so as far as buses going in and out of Union Station, that will probably not be the focus of the Spear and 23rd bridge replacement project. Um, it's, we do have a express lane master plan that talks about some of those things, but the, the one we highlighted today specifically focuses on multimodal movements across I-25 and replacing the dated infrastructure. Mr. Welch. Yeah, Austin, thank you for bringing that up. You read my mind because 10 years ago, the uh, Northwest Area Mobility Study look, did a preliminary look at bi-directional express lanes. And I don't recall it's been 10 years, so I'm not sure what some of the federal and state difficulties were associated with it. But it's, it's time to revisit that and, and see if that can't proceed now and, and uh, unpack some of the reasons. I, and I don't think they were primary financial. I recall there were some other federal problems and hurdles related to the shoulders and the width of the lanes and things like that. But I, I think it has merit to revisit that and take another look. Anything would make life easier as a bus operator, since I am a bus operator for RGD. Um, there you go. Other questions, comments? Any final comments from you? Thank you very much for being here. We appreciate your you. time. And moving forward, uh, number eight, the RTD system-wide fair study and equity analysis. And again, we'll uh, turn it over to Ron Papstor for the introduction. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, members, an another really important regional effort underway is RTD's evaluation of their fair system and equity analysis. So we uh, have invited RTD to come and give you an update on their, their work. They're at some critical milestone points and some decision points. So I thought it was important to uh, allow this group to, to hear about RTD's work on evaluating their fair system. Thank you. Uh, Bill Soroy, sorry. Thanks, Ron. Uh, again, my name is Bill Soroy. I'm the Senior Manager of Transitory Communities at RTD and part of the project management team for the system-wide fair study and equity analysis. So um, when our Gen new or new, when our general manager, Deborah Johnson, um, got here a few years ago, um, one of the first things that she commented on was the fares and the complication of our system in terms of understanding it as somebody new to the area. Um, taking that, fast forwarding to that, you know, um, into uh, the beginning of last year, um, she really initiated an effort for us to take a look, a comprehensive look at our fares. And we had gotten you know, a fair amount of fair amount of feedback um, uh, about, you know, how expensive they were, how complicated they were, and is there anything that we can do to, to improve that. So we initiated this effort um, and kind of started out with three goals, which focus, you know, initially on equity, which is, you know, making sure that people that need um, and have the ability to use the transit but are, are burdened financially can, can afford it and, and can really do that. And then the next one really is affordability, aligning those fares with the service received. So making sure that you're getting the bang for your buck. And then lastly, which is one of the ones that we heard most about thus far during the, during the process is simplicity, making our fares much easier to understand than they currently are. So, um, this is kind of a gives you a sense of the of the scope or the the schedule of the project. We initiated this back last spring um, with really a focus on you know getting some feedback on our existing fare system, um, hearing what people liked, that what they didn't like, and then kind of translating that, and moving that forward into the development and kind of feedback a feedback loop to um, understand kind of some different concepts, throwing them out there and getting some some different. Um, uh, feedback and, you know, in input from the community. And again, our process was very customer and community focused, uh, something that we really prided ourselves on in this effort. Um, and, you know, we are at the stage right now where basically we have a draft alternative that we are going to be taking out to the public to get some feedback on. So it's a very critical stage for us. Um, and then ultimately we will go to the board later this summer um, for you know, consideration of adoption of a new fare structure and then implementing that sometime early next year. So this um, previous phase that we completed really at the end of last year, which was really focused on um, 
understanding some basic, throwing out some concept, conceptual alternatives and getting some feedback on them. Um, we really had a very extensive um, input process and community feedback process. Um, we had a very robust online presence. Um, we had um, an extensive amount of um, surveys completed that we did. We did a big survey this time. Um, we had, for the first time at RTD, we focused on working with um, community-based organizations to actually utilize them during the process to go out and reach out to some communities that typically are hard to reach. Um, those people that have kind of those relationships um, with those community members, and I think we really, we're really encouraged by the results that we got from that process. Um, we, we had, you know, more of the traditional realm of targeted um, stakeholder groups focused on kind of three areas of jurisdictions, equity, and then past programs that really was useful in terms of vetting some of the ideas and the feedback that we heard. And then, um, like I said, we did have a pretty extensive use of surveys throughout the process. And it really, like I said, we really focused a lot on language access and, and providing the language access to folks that, you know, aren't uh, native English speakers. And I think we really have got some really valuable input from those members of the community um, as well during this whole process. Um, so this slide really is intended to kind of show in terms of this, this the, the alternative or the, the milestone three, kind of what we threw out to the public and, and our stakeholders for feedback on. So the top um, matrix shows kind of our current fare structure. Um, the bottom two really are two um, conceptual alternatives that we threw out. The bottom one, bottom left, alternative A was focused on just lowering our fares and focus on lowering our fares. Alternative B was focused, make, focused on making it more simple, easier to understand. So you can see with alternative B in particular, flattening the fare system, really only having one basic fare, then an airport premium really did simplify it. And then on the, on the, you know, on the left, really just focusing, not, not a huge decrease, but a, a fairly significant in terms of particularly on the monthly side, um, a re reduction in price. So a lot of the feedback that we heard during the process was pretty overwhelming feedback for alternative B. Um, most people liked it um, and wanted um, that as kind of, kind of the basis for moving forward. We did hear some other things in terms of some of the segments of the population that probably utilize their local fares more, um, that they wanted to see that lower local fare. So one of the things that we did and where we are at in terms of this proposed draft is we took both those and did some refinements to alternative B um, and proposed this as the current uh, draft fare structure. So you can see that we reduced, um, we combined the local and regional into one fare, so lowering that to 275. Um, and then pay particular attention to the monthly pass, which was really a significant reduction, particularly those for those in the airport and regional category where you're going from $200 to 88. So a reduction in over 50%, um, very significant. And, and focusing on those people who really use transit a lot and, and incentivizing people to use transit. And then on the discount side, in terms of those people that are seniors, um, those with disabilities, and then um, those enrolled in our LIV program, we uh, tried to simplify that as well under one price, basically, for depending on the type of trip you're taking. If you're taking a one-way trip or a day pass or a monthly pass, again, very significant reduction in those prices. Um, on the airport fare, just a little bit on that, uh, we heard a lot of input, particularly going into this from the airport, about how expensive it was and how the airport workers felt that they were not priced out, but it was a disincentive for them to use transit because of how expensive it was. So what we focused on here was we still have, you know, the higher three-hour fare, um, but what we heard during our um, survey process was the occasional customer, those people um, like me yesterday coming in, traveling either personally or for, for business coming in from out of town that used um, the A-line thought it was a reasonable price, a, a one-way fare of, of 10 or 10, in this case, 10, 10 50, um, to get into downtown was not a bad deal. But those that use it more frequently, you know, that even though we did have a, re a reduced um, day pass, it, it was still more expensive. So what we, what we did here was focused on really lowering that monthly pass so that they could have better access. 
And again, you can see also on the discount side where there is a very significant reduction in cost for those that are in those discount categories. Um, on the accessoride side, we again commensurate with some of the other discounts or the other reductions in fares. We looked at we we're looking at lowering that as well. Again, simplify with the simplification factor going from a, a, a a local regional and airport fare just to, to a local regional and then an airport um, to so going down from five to 450 um, having uh, uh, you know also here we have the the new introduction of those that are in the accessoride category of being eligible for live discount and let me back up for a second for live as I, I forget my audience sometimes in terms of what live is live is our uh, income based um, fare program so those that qualify based on their income levels um, can get a reduced fare. Um, so that, that really is you know, an exciting effort in terms of creating better access for our accessoride program. Um, then there's some other program changes that we are um, entertaining and we wanted to go out and get some feedback from the public on. So on the LIV program itself, we're actually looking to increase the discount from 40% currently to 50% to align it with the other discount programs also increasing um, the income threshold um, before or currently we we're looking at 185 percent of the federal poverty level and we're looking to increase that to 250 percent which would put the put rtd up in kind of the probably at the top in terms of our peer agencies in terms of where we sit in terms of with the income an income-based fare program um, also we we are looking to do some expansion of our process right now we use the state's peak system which is used to you know, um, qualify people for things like SNAP and other federal discount programs to go beyond that. Because I think we've heard some feedback from a lot of people that either want to participate or choose not to is that they want other ways to access the program. So we're looking to, to ways to expand that. So again, some exciting proposed changes on that side. Um, on the EcoPass side, uh, you know, a lot of the feedback that we heard um, particularly in the last few years is the variability of the price in terms of you know one year it could go up you know a significant amount or go down a significant amount so we're trying to one of the things we're trying to adjust to the changes we're proposing is trying to make that a little bit more predictable and having a two-year fixed price so it's a little bit less variability also reducing kind of the barrier to entry um, in terms of reducing contract minimums and this pricing wouldn't take effect until 2024 again with kind of the other parts of the proposal also, one of the things in terms of simplification, we are con combining some of the way the EcoPass pricing categories work in terms of combining some of the service level areas, which those are kind of the areas in terms of based upon service where you're priced at. Right now, I think our matrix is like 16, there's 16 different prices that you can do, or I think we're looking to simplify that into three or four different prices. So really trying to reduce the complicated um, approach to, you know, getting a pass. Um, then there's some exciting new programs that are under consideration. Probably first and foremost is the Zero Fare for Youth pilot. Um, this, is a, this is something that a lot of other agencies across the country are either implementing or considering. And it basically would be allow um, youth 19 and under um, to use our system for free. Um, and it, it is, um, one of those programs where, you know, if for a long-term viability, we do need some, some, some outside funding. And I think that's part of the pilot is to get, you know, people excited about it and maybe to get some outside funding from some other um, folks in terms of, you know, thinking that is a good, good thing for other people to invest in. So we are also looking at creating a bulk, a bulk purchase program similar to what we used to have previous to 2019, we made that change. And then one exciting program is the Transit Assistance Grant Program. This addressed some of the um, challenges that we've had with our nonprofit program, which is those nonprofits that have kind of more of that immediate need um, where they have a client that needs fair media immediately and they, can't, they don't have the ability to sign up for a LIB program. And this would provide some grant funds that would provide those kinds of organizations um, you know, fair media either for free or a deep discount so that they can provide access to those folks in most in need. And then lastly, uh, another program that's under consideration is a semester pass, and this would be 
an alternative to our college pass, which is more of an um, insurance-based model where it's an, called an all-in, so you have to buy it for all of your students. This is kind of an opt-in, so you can buy it for select students. It would be at a, a deeper discount um, for, you know, com particularly community colleges and other higher ed institutions that don't, are, are, don't want to participate in our college pass program. So um, that's kind of an overview of the uh, proposed changes as um, we know it. And then in terms of the next steps, so we'll be going to our board next month um, and, and moving out with um, these draft recommendations and, and having a public um, review in May. Um, and then coming back to our board based on that feedback with, you know, a final fair structure in July and then um, with implementation sometime early next year. It does take us a few months to kind of gear up to make a, a big change like this. So we will be looking to implement that in the first quarter of 2024. So with that, I will open it up for any questions. Here. Commissioner Stewart. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. When I ran the TMO on the North uh, area, you know, we asked people, why don't you take transit? Why don't you buy eco passes? Why don't you do this or that? And they would tell us all the reasons they couldn't do it. You're addressing a lot of that. I'm really eager to see this come about, and I applaud your board and your management for um, tackling this one more time. So thank you. Commissioner Hogan. Thank you. Thank you so much for the overview. I was so excited when I got the agenda because I've been looking forward to this. I love RTD. RTD was my freedom when I was a non-driving teenager that I could just get out and go. I moved abroad and I came back almost seven years ago and I couldn't figure out the system. I was like, how did I figure out transportation system in a whole other country and I can't do it in my own backyard? And so I think you all are taking steps to address that, which is really exciting. Um, so I have 20,000 questions, but I'm gonna focus on two of them. <laughs> um, the first one is, um, did you learn anything different by talking to the community-based organizations or anything from that survey that was uh, pretty specific? So I'm assuming those were, as you mentioned, hard to reach communities. Um, curious if there was anything different. And then my second question is, how were the results of the Free Fair Month utilized um, on the analysis utilized or incorporated to either complement this or figure out a different way? You know, what I would say with the community-based outreach, um, one is learning just in terms of what some of their challenges were. Um, like I said, and I, I think, you know, some of the things that we heard in some of those community-based organizations was, one, the complication of the system, that there was fairly consistent feedback from the community-based outreach about the, complication, the complicated nature of our system. But what we did hear, too, that kind of helped shape kind of our, our recommendations as we have is that there were some members of those groups that were saying, you know, we still want that reduced fare because a lot, you know, our biggest portion of our ridership base is people that use the local pass. And, you know, under the, the initial kind of alternative B approach, there wasn't any reduction to that. So looking at that and looking at the feedback that we got, we are able to adjust it to reflect you know, where we could actually lower that for those local users. And then your second question was about... Um, the free fair month, the August yes. analysis. Um, so, you know, the free fair month was very interesting. I think some of the, the things that we learned um, were, one, we didn't have some of the challenges that we were expecting in terms of, you know, who was using the system, and we did see a, a ridership boost. But I think, you know, we didn't... I don't think there's, there's a lot of application to this effort because we're not like proposing to go totally free fare and we're focused on the youth side. But I think that the thing that we did learn was really it wasn't quite, quite the change that we were expecting and it was actually, you know, from our perspective, um, a lot more benefit than we probably had assumed just because of the fact there weren't some of the, you know, the, the challenges that we had assumed going in. So. And I guess if I can just add one more thing, um, I'm really excited about the youth pilot program because you are investing in future customers. And for of the many people that I talked to during that free fair month, um, it was people who hadn't ridden the bus again, but at one point did, just like me. And so I think if there's any possibility to actually get that funded, I think that would be a very strategic investment. Thank you very much. Uh, Director Wheel. Yeah. Um, 
couple of questions that are related. What do you anticipate the impact on ridership to be as a result of the fare changes? Currently have them. And then how sustainable does it look going forward? Um, change in ridership, fares, you know, are yet self covered financially. Yeah, yeah. So um ridership levels depending on because the biggest impact on ridership is actually the zero fare for youth program, which has a fairly significant amount. You know, depending on the permanency of that, you know, we see an, between an eight and a fourteen percent bump in ridership. At least that's kind of what our models say. Um, on the long-term viability side, I mean, one of the things that going into this that we said is that any proposed reduction in fares can't affect our ability to provide service. And so we looked at our mid-term financial plan, which is our six-term, six-year, you know, financial outlook for the agency. So within that six years. Um, with this reduction, we see that you know we we aren't going to see any impact to service levels. Now, I can't say I can't predict beyond that six years, because I know that you know many agencies like us, when you go beyond that six years, there we have some we may have some challenges that we don't know fully about. One of which is paper, which comes due next year. But you know there are some challenges that we're going to have to address probably later on. But for at least for the next six years, we're looking that it, it looks pretty good in terms of the impact. And the ability to provide service with this fare reduction. We will do Director Pusak and then we'll uh, do Director Ward. Thanks. And thanks, Bill. And I want to thank Bill and, and the entire staff at RTD that have been working on hard work. It's a long time coming and exciting to see it, it progressing. One of the big challenges that we had to face and that I think helps us in this process is our financial. Shout out to Doug McLeod, our CFO, and his because uh, started to thing the giant backlog in our state of good and our pension much higher. And my fellow directors here will remember that in the 2019 proposed at a, a assumption of a 10% fare increase every year moving forward. So um, another one of the things I think is really exciting is the semester pass for community colleges. When I first came on in 2019, I met with uh, the president at Front Range Community College, and you know our goal is to try to get people on a, a, well to try to get them to buy the college pass, you know the the pass for school. And it had to do with the fact that they have five acres of parking around the community college. So um, this hopefully will promote the, the concept of training. Thanks again, Bill. Director Ward. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I appreciate the work that you guys have done to reduce the fares and actually simplify the fare structure from a driver's perspective. That is one of the most contentious parts of the fare, for especially for those who drive regional routes. Um, I do wish you guys would have gone lower in that local fare, or the fares in general. Um, in my experience, that 25 cents, people will just eat dollars in the fare box. Not worth their time to try and go make change and then carry that around. And I would also like to see the airport fare be the same slide, local fare like many of your peer transit agencies do. Um, one question I do have in regards to the LIVE program, I, I'm, am I correct in understanding that they have to come down to district shops and fill out all the paperwork and get signed up there? No. Where do they sign up at? No, they, they you know, my understanding, of the, they, I think they can do, you, you Director Williams may even know more than I do, but, um, they, ha they have to go through the state's peak system so they can do that and they can work with, we do actually have um, some of the social service agencies to work with in terms of helping people to you know, access the peak system, which again, it's a challenge. The system itself is still a challenge because it is you know, a little bit onerous for, to come out and then to fill out some of those things. But, and one, that's one of the things that we are trying to address. But no, they do not have to go down to district shops in order to, to apply for the LIB program. Okay, but they do have to come like in person to try and start somewhere 
in the district, they have to go in person to access the peak system. Yeah, they usually have to work with somebody to do it. I mean, if, if they can't do it themselves, they, they, they can provide um, that. But I think, it's, I think it can be done online so they don't have to do it in person. So they can actually, if they have, assuming they have access to a computer, which is another challenge for some people. Yes, I asked that because I was curious if you guys were to partner with each county's uh, Health and Human Services Department. So that way, if someone in Longmont needs to go down I don't know where the closest location would be. You know, sometimes on the periphery of our district bound service is not the best and to take a whole day out to go sign up for a reduced. I don't think good. Right. Dr. Williams. That's great input, um, Austin. Thank you. Most of the application can be done online. Um, I am not current enough to know if you can upload the picture requirement, but I know that it is technologically feasible to do that. And in most area libraries are cognizant of the program and I have been helping people to do the application, as well as Mr. Soroy said, many of the nonprofits in the region who are involved in RTD's nonprofit, nonprofit pass program. Um, have experience in helping people do this, but I, I want to, while I have the microphone, it's dangerous, um, <laughs> I want to point out that most of our um, peers in transit receive 23% on the average funding from their state, and RTD gets less than 1%. So any reductions that we cannot do are not solely on us. Um, I'd like to have that on the record. Thank you. For example, uh, Mr. Rex and then Mr. Papstorf, or you guys can choose which one goes first. I want to sing if you ask. <laughs> sure, I do. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And Bill, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I do want to commend the board and staff for the comprehensiveness in which you've reviewed this. I. I was sitting here watching this and smiling proudly um, because of those of us that served on the past program working group back in the day. Um, yeah, you all know that we, you know, we we tried to get to where we were exactly, and uh, so I'm I'm very appreciative of uh, of the the actions that that staff and the board will take here in the near future. So thank you, Mr. Papstorf. Thank you. I echo that. I would have, except for the past working group, which I did not thankfully participate in, uh, would have echoed a lot of the rest. I, I we really, have guards. Yeah, oh, yeah. I really do appreciate that. I do have a, I do have a couple questions, and I'm, I'm, I am intrigued by the A line and the fare to the airport. And I wonder if you all looked at the option of having the $10 fare to the airport, but applying the local fare to the more neighborhood stops along the A-line that serve the community before you get to the airport and whether there is some opportunity to look at that a little differently because it makes sense, $10 makes perfect sense compared to the cost of parking or the cost of an Uber or any other way to get to the airport to access the airport. But the A-line serves a lot more than just the airport. So I, I am interested in whether you looked at that or whether there are options or uh, an opportunity to look at some system like that. And then uh, I'll give my second question on the table real quick as well, and then I'll be done. Um, I'm super excited about the reduction of cost of the monthly passes. I think that that is a huge benefit to users of the system. I, I am curious if RTD is still looking at ways through technology to have a fare capping system, because even at $88 a month, that can still be as an upfront, one time upfront cost can still be a barrier to achieving a monthly pass. And if you pay the local fare for two trips a day for five days a week, you're at $110 a month versus $88, which is the cost of the monthly pass. So fare capping could be a real benefit to lower income people that may not quite qualify for live, but that cost of that month, that upfront cost of the monthly pass can still be a barrier. Well, um, the answer to both your questions are actually, we are already doing both of those. So on the A-line, the only people that are gonna be paying $10 are people that originate or or destined for the airport. So if you get on anywhere from 61st and Pena to Union, between there and Union Station, you're gonna pay 275. And so 
as long as you're, your destination or your origin is not at the airport, you will just be paying 275 to ride the A-line. So that, so we are addressing that. And then on the fair, all of the, the monthly passes that, you, that, that were outlined do assume fare capping. We already are doing fare capping. Um, that was implemented, um, I believe, um, in, when we launched our account-based ticketing program, which I'm trying to remember exactly when that was, was last fall. Um, so that program is already in place, and all of those um, monthly pass prices assume fare capping. So that, that's already in place. Mr. Williams, then Director of Ward. Mr. Williams. I just wanted, I, there's no page number on here, but if you look at the page that says proposed draft fare structures, and maybe, I don't know, Bill, can you, can you back up? The one that shows, yeah, that one. That will help you, Mr. Papsdorf, and anybody else look at what is happening with the airport fare. And so the discounted fares, again, back to my question to Dr. Cog, what percent of our population falls under these categories? I mean, it's a dollar thirty-five to go to the airport. Um, so a lot of this stuff, and, and we will correct our slide to not say seniors. It will say older adults after this presentation, thank you. Dr. Ward. And, and Ron, to your question, you can see in the parentheses on the bottom of the slide that it shows you, so currently, if you were to ride our system and have a monthly pass, it would take you 38 one-way trips during the course of a month to get up to that price. Under the new, the new proposed, it will only take you 32 trips, and then only 20 trips if you're <clears throat> using the discount pass. Director Ward, then uh, Mr. Silverstein. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I brought up the airport fare of $10 because your entire system doesn't actually follow under that. Um, the 104L is now a $3 fare, and it goes straight to the airport as well. So I just wanted to bring up. Uh, in regards to uh, Director Papstor's comments about fare capping, that fare capping doesn't apply to those that always pay a cash fare. And there are many people that don't have access to um, or choose not to use my ride structure or the, uh, the app. And I think there needs to be a way to air cap those individuals. Um, that is a, is a huge expense. And I do have those people that ride the routes that I drive. Thank you. Mr. Silverstein. Thank you very much. And just to probe a little deeper on the financials, um, you had mentioned earlier that the new proposed fare structures don't impact, uh, I think you said level of service, maybe that's mm -hmm. the phrase. Um, but did you, was there an analysis done that said if there was no change, this would be the projected revenue? Mm -hmm. And then with the, with the modifications, um, this would be the projected is there a significant drop in projected revenue and that needs to be made up with some other source or could you could you go there sure so one of the things that we did do so if you if you compare to our current fare structure um, with the proposed fare structure it's a it's a 20 to 25 percent reduction in fare revenue but one of the things that we've experienced is previous to the pandemic our fare revenue made up anywhere from 15 to 20 percent of our total fare revenue, now it makes up eight to 10. So it's a, much, a fairly significant drop that we've had over the last few years. So in addition to that, um, in some of the early um, aspects of this plan, talking with Doug McLeod, our CFO, they made some assumptions in our midterm financial plan about reducing fares. So they built that into our six year financial plan. So we're pretty consistent with the recommendations that you have, I think we're like between one and between one and seven percent kind of range in terms of meeting those targets. So that's why we feel confident because fares have become actually a, a, a lower proportion of our overall re revenue based upon kind of what we've experienced on the ridership side. And you know, so there isn't as big of an impact as you might have if if it wasn't you know if we were in kind of a pre-pandemic mode. Commissioner Stanton, do I see you? Okay. Any other final uh, questions? 
Thank you so much for the presentation. Very helpful and, and great questions as well. Thank you for the very insightful questions. With that, we will move ahead to member comment, other matters. I will start with just a comment before we go to the reports. I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, I think whether your staff or volunteer elected, uh, your, the time and efforts and energy you put towards this is valued. And I just want to acknowledge that and thank you all for being here. With that, we'll move forward to the CDOT report. Um, I'll Stan? give a quick overview and then give it to Commissioner Holguin and then we'll go to RTD, Michael Buss. Um, I wanted to share with you what we're doing this week in our workshops. We're going to be doing something on fiber optic. We're going to do budget. We're going to do audit. We're going to do equity. And we're going to do I-25 segment five. Thank you to the engineers for briefing. Thanks for what you do every day. Uh, Nick Farber is going to talk about TIFIO loans, and that's a, a key thing for getting Segment 5 funded. And uh, if Commissioner Stewart was here, she would be uh, the biggest advocate of continuing the completion of I-25. I want to say something to this group. We talk Dr. Cog, we talk local, but how many times have we talked interstate commerce? How many times have we talked motorists? who are increasing because of our wonderful mountains, our tourist traffic, and people just going through the state, I-25, 70, 76. How many times do we talk about the truckers? How many times do we talk about the truckers' effect on air quality and all of this? And I want to mention that uh, we are also going to be talking within the commission this week about uh, House Bill 1103, ozone transit and the late amendment that was put in to refigure TPR and uh, MPO boundaries. And that's extremely controversial. Has anybody heard about the controversy in the, anyway, we're catching up because that caught us by surprise. And um, off the record, sort of, uh, commissioners put together revised language to that amendment which is being considered, and we will be discussing that. Um, something else we'll be discussing within the commission, um, April 25th, 2019. If you go to Wikipedia, that's the infamous Lakewood truck crash. That crash killed four people, including a Jeffco employee from headquarters. Um, our engineers, and uh, thank you to RTD Micklebust and her team, did a couple years of exhaustive efforts in planning for a truck runaway ramp that would have gone down the center of I-70 as you uh, flattened out coming down that long hill. And we understand that has been uh, put on hold. So we commissioners will be talking about that and hearing from our chief engineer and safety people on what else there is. What else there is, if that doesn't happen, is a Mount Vernon runaway truck ramp. That ramp could be improved. Uh, there could be more signage. And our vice chair, Gary Beatty from Genoa, a rancher, is going to co has come up with the idea that how come we don't have more signs in Spanish for out-of-state truckers? Why? That's a safety issue. So he's going to bring that up this week, and I would like to give that to you all. Uh, remember to put those signs in Spanish. And that is uh, going to be an interesting discussion. I also, speaking of uh, Vice Chair Beatty, um, because of family situation, suddenly we are uh, moving, and I will be stepping down after this month. So for April through June, uh, Vice Chair Beatty will be the chair. He will now be assisted as uh, in the vice chair capacity by Lisa Hickey, who has distinguished herself in greenhouse gas uh, com committees, and uh, she is from Colorado Springs. So I will miss being in this group. It's always been vibrant, and um, I appreciate uh, being part of it. And I'll turn it over to Commissioner Holgan. Thank you. Um, 
Commissioner Stetton, um, you covered it very well. I think the only thing that I'll add is that with all the transition internally at CEDA and with the Transportation Commission, we just have a lot of um, reorganizing to do. But I'm very excited about it. And thank you for your service, um, Commissioner Stetton. It's been wonderful to serve with you. And I look forward to your hearing about your next journey. Anything else from CDOT? Uh, just a couple quick notes, and we will miss you, Commissioner Stanton. Thank you for your service and your mentorship. Um, a couple exciting things in Region 1 tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow um, at Transportation Commission, there's been a lot of energy around bus and rapid transit in Region 1 and in Region 4. We're doing a presentation to the Transportation Commission on the um, upcoming BRT efforts, if you're interested in listening, or after Transportation Commission, it's also online. Uh, we had a public meeting uh, last week for the Floyd Hill project. We will be starting construction in June, and it was a very, very good public meeting. We've done some great legwork, and um, it, it showed by the comments we received by the public and um, generally just kind of some logistical questions on how the project will work, how timing of notifications for highway closures and rock blasting and things like that will work. So that was a good meeting. And lastly, very excited about the Eisenhower Johnson Memorial Tunnel. Actually, just the Eisenhower portion is having its 50th anniversary. Um, we were out there last week, and we'll have some more celebrations coming into the summer that more people can be involved with. So that's a wrap for Region 1. Darius, did you have anything for CDOT? Um, the only other item I would add, um, uh, again, uh, thank you for all your service, uh, Commissioner Stanton. Um, really appreciate it over the years and various roles that I've had over the past couple of years. I think I've had three um, in that time. But um, our Director of uh, Transit and Rail, uh, Amber Blake, will be the month. So did want to note that for uh, this group as well. So, But other than that, that's about it. Thank you very much. Commissioner Stanton, uh, just as chair of this body, thank you for your service. I've enjoyed your uh, presence and appreciate and respected your voice. So thank you for being here. RTV. Well, I'm glad Deborah didn't see me do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Deborah actually is at APTA Legislative, so she asked me to do a, a quick rundown, and we've got two directors here if they want to jump in. I just have two or three items. The Northwest Peak Hour Study continues to advance. That's uh, the district's intent to come up with a common set of facts for that project. We anticipate that next month there will be some ridership numbers as well as cost estimate updates from the previous work. Um, the district continues to focus on developing a and in, in, insisting on a welcoming transit environment. You're going to hear much more about that over the next few weeks, so stay tuned. Initial planning is already underway for 2023 Zero Fare for Better Air initiatives uh, in, in conjunction with the state. The 16th Street Mall construction, as you can see, is well underway. That's our first and last mile connection for the entire region. We, we look at it that way. So the mall shuttles are off on 15th and 17th, and we anticipate that'll stay that way probably you now for some time. And then finally, you probably saw um, it got buried after the that bank had those problems on Friday, but the Colfax Bus Rapid Transit project received a high rating from FTA in the president's budget. Uh, you, if you're familiar with the capital investment grant program, it is very difficult to get a high rating. Uh, there's only a couple other projects in the entire Small Starts program that received that rating, so we're really excited that that's one more milestone. Thank you, Dr. Cog. Thank you, State. Thank you for all of our partners. Um, city and County of Denver who are making that project come to fruition. And that's what I have. And we're not last because now there's RAC. <laughs> Anything else from uh, RTD from any of the directors? Okay. Mr. Silverstein. Right. Hey, thank you. And uh, I'll be quick because I know we're, we're over time. Um, just a couple of items. I, I just would like to express a appreciation to, um, to this uh, committee um, and to Dr. Cog for um, the uh, 
approval of the uh, the set aside policy, which of course, as you can all tell, carves out a nice chunk of, of money um, for the Regional Air Quality Council. So on behalf of my board, uh, I would just like to thank Art, uh, uh, Dr. Cog for um, for having the, the, the set aside option and of course directing monies to the rack and, and I will keep you all briefed as to the progress of that we are um, making as, as 2024 um, approaches as we put together our program. We've already talked with Dr. Cog about the, uh, the staff about the kinds of uh, initiatives we'll launch with this, um, with this generous amount of money. So we'll be, um, we'll be putting that uh, to great use. And again, just appreciation to Dr. Cog for including RAC in, in the, uh, the set-aside policy. And uh, just a, a plug for um, some of our work at the RAC, we have launched um, committees to uh, assess uh, new emission control strategies to improve summertime air quality, our, our, our ozone non-attainment problem. And um, for, for this uh, group's benefit, one of the, um, the, the primary activities, there's an oil and gas work group, which um, deals with, of course, that, that industry. The state is also initiating oil and gas um, regulatory um, initiatives. Uh, but we are um, initiating lawn and garden equipment initiatives. So lawn and garden equipment has been called out, identified as a significant contributor to summertime ozone. And um, we are looking at um, expanding our incentive programs to get electric equipment in the hands of, of government agencies, uh, commercial operators. So all of you in government, which includes transit and state agencies, can apply for monies that we have at uh, at, at RAC, we have an open um, uh, application process now so that you get basically um, you go shopping, get um, electric equipment, retire gasoline equipment. And so check our website, raqc.org, modownpollution.org, another, another way to get to us to, to, um, to take advantage of those resources. And then also looking at regulatory efforts going forward, summertime use restrictions on gasoline equipment at the government and commercial level, not residential at this point, but at the government and commercial levels. And so that will be, first of all, take advantage of our money so that you're prepared to um, um, go electric. But in the future, you may not be able to use that gas-powered small equipment, blowers, trimmers, um, small mowers to begin with in those summer months, which of course is landscaping season, mowing season. So that's what we're working on at the rack, and it'll, I'm sure, get more attention as, as, uh, as this program builds. But um, that's, that's my update for today. Thank you. Other matters? Uh, Just a question. I really appreciate that effort on the mowers. Are you working uh, with the local landscaping companies and giving them incentives to go away? Because many of the people involved are the poorest among us, and we can't take away their livelihood while we're trying to get the ozone right. Absolutely, and and that's what we're we're working to build to fundraise, especially to get monies into the local um, contractors, those um, small landscapers, um, that money into their hands, so that if a, a use restriction go, goes into place, or a, even a sales restriction on gasoline equipment going forward as well, if that kind of um, you know if that is our future, we want to definitely expand our incentive programs to include that DI community, those um, small businesses, minority-owned businesses, any, any landscaper doing work in, in our region um, can take advantage of our, of our resources. And, and that's an area that we, we don't have the kind of incentive dollars yet for the, um, the commercial operators, but we're building that program. And hopefully in, in six months and, and a year, we'll have you know, the money we have for the public sector. Right now, we have about a million dollars for the public sector, a little bit more. But we need $10 million, um, to really incentivize a difference. And that same dollar figure goes to, you know, the small operators. So it's all about fundraising and, and building those programs. But we're beginning. Thank you. Other comments and announcements? Mr. Papstorff. Just a couple of quick things. Before the chair announces the April 18th meeting, um, hold it. But we are anticipating the likely possibility of canceling, not needing the April meeting. So just... Keep that in the back of your mind. We'll get notice out as soon as we possibly can um, on that. In the meantime, and since Jessica raised the regional BRT program, 
did want to just alert this group that, you know, we are working hard with our part, all of our partners involved in that program, RTD, CDOT, Dr. Cog, our, lo our principal local partners about making sure that we're coordinating. Because what we really want to do is implement this regional BRT program, um, and it's going to take all of us working together. So we're, work we're taking some steps to formalize that partnership. You'll hear more about that and making sure that we have a structure in place to coordinate all of our work on implementing that really important um, program around the region. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'm done. Thank you. Other comments? I've got one. Uh, Cam is incredible, and we thank you for all of your work. He is especially popular at the end of meetings because he has the parking pass. <laughs> so if you park downstairs, uh, see him for the uh, voucher to, to get out with paid parking. So with that, uh, I won't even make the announcement on 10. We'll, we'll, we'll see if you uh, make a promise if you're able to keep it to us. <laughs> Again, thank you all for being here. Have a great day. Meeting adjourned.